Hello, welcome to Only For Your Ears and welcome to today's episode 11, The Red Shoes, which I've renamed as The Curse of Poverty. The structure will remain the same. We'll start off with a short summary, highlighting the most important points of the story. Then we'll go into a critical review on how the story plays in today's society and lastly, but not least, the trigger points, which I'll explain more in detail about the trigger points at the end, if you do not understand what triggers are. Okay, let's begin. The Curse of Poverty. The principal character of The Red Shoes is a young peasant girl named Karen. She is so poor, she has no shoes except a rough pair of wooden shoes to wear in the winter. I digress. The condition of poverty most definitely could have laid the foundation for greed, temptation, with a thirst for luxury and opulence when you come from a meagre background which is considered below the poverty line. The local shoemaker makes her some red shoes fashioned from red cloth. When Karen's mother dies, she wears the shoes, even though their color is hardly appropriate for mourning attire. I digress here again. Karen wore the red shoes to mourn her mother at church in spite of the color. This is out of respect and love for her mother, not defiance in any way towards the church. An old lady is passing one day and takes pity on the poor girl. She adopts Karen, burning her awful red shoes soon afterwards. I digress again. The adoptive mother should never have thrown out those shoes. There's a sense of disregard for her precious shoes that were made for Karen. It's probably the only real present she's ever had. The shoes were made out of a loving, kind gesture from the cobbler. When the time comes for Karen to be confirmed into the church, she is taken to a shoe shop to purchase some shoes. Inspired by the sight of the princess wearing a pair of bright red shoes, Karen persuades the old lady to buy her a pair of red shoes in the shop. I digress. So the girl lied about a fantasy she had or didn't have. Most girls want to be like a princess or at least wear something uh, wear something similar to what a princess would wear, like a pair of shoes, just to make her feel special, even if she does come from poverty. Is this such a terrible sin? The old lady agrees, but only because her sight is so bad that she cannot tell what color they are. After all, red would not be an appropriate color to wear to one's confirmation at church. Indeed, everyone in the congregation is shocked when they see Karen wearing the red shoes in church during her confirmation ceremony. Afterwards, they told the old lady that Karen wore red shoes to the service and the old lady chastised Karen for her naughtiness, telling her she must wear black shoes to church from now on. But Karen is too in love with the red shoes. So she defies the, defies the old lady's command and wears her red shoes to church the following week too. I digress. Unfortunately, there are far worse things than a pair of shoes that have gone down in the church where, thought of it, where the thought of it would make one cringe. Outside of the church, an old soldier offers to shine her sho their shoes and he remarks that Karen's shoes are dancing shoes. In church, her red shoes draw comments and gusts from the congregation again and Karen is so busy thinking of her shoes that she neglects to sing along with the hymns or recite the Lord's Prayer. I digress. Just because you forget to sing the Lord's Prayer, it doesn't mean their intentions were neglectful of God. She's an excited child and 
she's so happy to be wearing her new shoes. She comes from poverty, for goodness sake. As they're leaving the church, the old soldier remarks on Karen's shoes again, at which point her, her feet begin to, to dance of their own accord. She has no control over them. I digress. The soldier called out what it really is, calling a spade a spade. They get home. The old lady puts the shoes away in a cupboard, but Karen can't leave them uh, leave them be and goes to look. I digress. This is typical. If you lock something away from a child, they will become obsessed with it, which is exactly what Karen did. The old lady falls ill and Karen knows she should stay at should stay by her side. I digress. The feeling of guilt is palpable in Karen. However, she is so obsessed with her newfound happiness, but she has been invited to a grand ball in town. So dons her red shoes and leaves the old lady who has done so much for her and cared for her she, and when she had nobody. But at the ball, she goes, the shoes do whatever they like, forcing Karen to dance in whatever direction they please. Growing frightened, she tries to take them off, but they are stuck fast. The burden of guilt that Karen feels while her sick mother is laying down is very, very strong, people. She dances all the way out of the church and out of town, but eventually she makes it back to the church. At the church door, an angel appears telling her that she will continue to dance in her red shoes until she's pale and cold. Oh, that doesn't sound like a good omen. I digress. Karen feels afraid because she can't control the shoes, just like she can't control her own obsession. Karen learns that the old lady has died. She goes to the executioner's house and begs to, begs to cut off her feet so she will be freed from the curse of the red shoes. That's exactly what it is. It's a curse that she did not bring on to herself, but these shoes were already cursed. I digress. She goes to a professional who kills people. She is riddled with guilt and a feeling of sin. He does so, making her some wooden feet and crutches so she can walk back to the church. I digress. Unfortunately, she feels she needs to be punished for just being an excited child. The curse of living, uh, of coming from poverty. However, when she gets to the church, she finds the red shoes still dancing in front of her. And she runs home, terrified and saddened. She tries to go to church a second time, but once again, the shoes appear dancing in front of her. I digress. These shoes were already possessed. This has nothing to do with her. She goes to the person's house and begs him to take her into the service. And he does. So when his wife takes pity on her, when the family asks if she will accompany them to church, she declines, but the angel appears at her, to her once again, bringing the church to her with the, girls, with the girls' room slowly turning into a church with all its congregation seated within. Overcome by relief of being back in church, Karen feels her heart bursts with happiness and she dies. I digress. She pays the final sacrifice for happiness and being that special girl, at least for a while. Then she soars with the angels. Okay, that's the end of the summary. Now for my critical review on how this story would play in today's society.
This is an incredible story about guilt, sin, judgment, joy, and happiness, all wrapped up in one. An old, God-fearing woman adopts Karen, a young, poor girl she takes pity on after she sees her leaving her mother's funeral. And the first thing she does is burn her precious red shoes that were made by the local cobbler. The colour demonstrates the most important symbol in the Bible, the blood of Christ, atonement, sacrifice, life, death, etc. So when it's time for her to be confirmed in the church, the old woman needs to get her a new pair of shoes. Karen chooses the red shoes, knowing full well her adopted mother can't see the colour well and gives a quick approval before leaving the shop with Karen. The poverty aspect and the guilt, sin, and the confirmation of Karen's saviour really highlights the biases that exists amongst the social classes in the church. For example, it's only natural for children <clears throat> who come from poverty to covert, after all, the privilege of more well-off families see, see, seen as normal, like a beautiful pair of shoes that would make her feel special. What's considered a sin amongst the poor isn't amongst the wealthy or the middle class. This goes unnoticed throughout the narration. Later on in the story, the shoes appear to be possessed and have a life of their own. Karen is riddled with guilt because she can't control the shoes. And she chooses to attend a party instead of making the sacrifice to look after her sick mother. When her mother dies, she's confronted by an angel who foretells the consequence of her sin and judgment will befall her. In the end, the turmoil she suffers from the red shoes comes to an end by Karen becoming her own saviour. Well, there are a couple of sentences that I want to take a look at to frame my review. The first sentence, but Karen is too in love with the red shoes. So she defies the old lady's command and wears her red shoes to church the following week too. Of course, she's going to deny, uh, refuse to take the command of her mother who repeatedly was tone deaf and threw away the most precious thing to her apart from her life so it says i digress unfortunately there are far worse things than a pair of shoes that have gone down in church where thought of it would make one cringe now i want to refer to uh, a case that took place i think in 2010, 11, when President Obama was in power. Now, I'm sure people are familiar with Trayvon, Trayvon Martin. Trayvon Martin's death would definitely make you cringe. This case had to do with classism, status, and racism. And towards the very end, you see his mother, a graciously a Christian, show such serenity and strength throughout the whole fiasco, I call it. So a 17-year-old black, tall black boy was gunned down in Florida with no handgun. His phone was found on the ground with an iced tea and a bag of Skittles. President Obama makes the sad mistake, yes, a sad mistake, a black president making a sad mistake by referring, sending his condolences and referring to Trayvon Martin as his own child. He says, Trayvon could have been my son. And the outrage, people, uh, American people were quite outraged by this. And I said, you know, for goodness sake, why? He's a black president and he's, he's sending his condolences to the family and saying, you know, that 
he's trying to experience what it's like to step into the shoes of this woman and her husband who's lost their 17 year old boy for nothing more than just trying to get home with a pair with um an iced tea and some skittles and america did not like it and the reason why they didn't like it is because Talking about the idea of savior, the savior archetype. When you have a black president, a black president is supposed to redeem and be the savior to white people. When you have a white president, a white president is supposed to be the savior for uh, the black community and the the different cultures, not the white community, but the black community especially. And this is a form of redemption, people. So George Zimmerman is well known by the police and has a tarnished record. His father is a retired judge in the Supreme Justice in Florida. He has gotten his son out of trouble for years for years absolutely for years the police know the judge so they often say oh it's a zimmerman kid give him a slap on the wrist and let him wrist and let him go neighbor so this man was doing a neighborhood watch and he saw trayvon walking along the street and because he saw him he decided to get out and be a big guy. So he called the dispatch officer and said, well, there's a big black guy and he looks as though he's going to cause trouble. Of course, if he was a white guy, he wasn't would be causing trouble, but it has to be a young teenage black guy causing trouble. So he said, please don't get out of the car. We'll handle it. Well, he decided to take the authority into his own hands because his father is a judge. And so, therefore, he feels as though he is entitled to take power into his own hands. And so that's exactly what he does. He follows the boy to the shop, and then the boy comes out, and he's walking, and he's walking quite fast, and he's talking to a friend on the phone because he's he's absolutely terrified he doesn't know what's going on why is this person doing what they're doing why are they chasing him and then he tackles him throws him onto the ground that his phone and drink go flying and the sweets go flying and then he turns he turns uh, turns him over and then the black boy is on top of him and before you know it he takes out the gun zimmerman does and shoots him straight through the heart he didn't stand a chance 17 year old boy all he was doing was babysitting his nephew and quickly went out the road to go and get something to drink and eat so the case continued and of course, you know, you know what happened. George Zimmerman got off. And, and that was it. It was just, it just got off. And the only gracious, great thing about that whole case, fiasco, was his parents, especially his mother, who is a God-fearing evangelical Christian. And she was so incredibly gracious. So there are many things, whether you're Christian or not, but in this case, being a Christian, it didn't matter. Prejudice, racism, classism, all of these things were wrapped up in one in this case. So that was the first sentence. The second sentence is, so the girl lied about a fantasy she had or didn't have. Most girls want to be a princess or at least wear something a princess would wear, like a pair of shoes, just to make her feel special, even if she does come from poverty. Is this such a terrible sin? Let's look at 
Debbie Reynolds snatching away the dignity of her own daughter's death from her in 2016, just because she wanted to continue being special. Debbie Reynolds was an old Hollywood uh, actress and her daughter, Carrie Fisher, was very, very well known, a writer to an actor and wrote many, many pieces. So Carrie Fisher was Debbie Reynolds' daughter. Carrie is a producer of the film Postcards from the Edge. It's loosely based on the real life relationship Carrie had with her mother, who was a total NPD personality disorder, narcissist personality disorder, like a lot of them are in Hollywood, unfortunately to say. In the film and in her in life, Debbie did everything she could to snatch all the attention for herself. Both parties were trapped in a codependent relationship. Debbie constantly competed with Carrie on every level to make herself feel superior as only a narcissist would do. Imagine competing with your own child. That's not love. That's total abuse. Carrie was a drug addict and suffered from bipolar, who, uh, who was a constant narcissistic narcissist supplier to her mother. Just like I was. What was the most what was most interesting? Carrie became a successful film producer, actor, writer, but yet she continued to emotionally uh, to be emotionally trapped by a woman who was incapable of being a real mother to her. That was really um, unfortunate. I mean, she had all this success despite uh, a lot of drug abuse and she, she could not rid herself from guilt, from basically being her mother's mother. And by, the, uh, by a mother that didn't... Uh, didn't take account for her behavior. That burden was on Carrie. Carrie had to be Debbie's mother, just like I had to be my mother's mother. In a surprise turn of events, Carrie suddenly took ill on a transatlantic flight to London, where she was hospitalized until her untimely death to heart disease. This was a complete shock to the world of Hollywood. But the next day, when her mother, Debbie Reynolds, was getting things ready for her own daughter's funeral, she became out of breath and asked her son to call for the ambulance because she felt ill. In a mirror event, Debbie had a massive stroke and died within 24 hours of Carrie's death. Her son recalled just before she got in the ambulance, she said, let me go. I must be with Carrie. So even in death, she competed with her own, with, with her daughter. And in typical fashion, Debbie stole the headline from her daughter. And instead of people rightfully paying respects to Carrie and then Debbie, everybody, including the whole world, were devastated for Debbie and how she was too heartbroken after her daughter's death. That is not true. I will tell you why she was. She couldn't live without Carrie. When you are a narcissist supplier and they take all the energy from you, when you when you leave or when you stop being their supplier they either find somebody else to fill them up with the energy that they need or they die and debbie reynolds chose to die um yes debbie's death in the last and final act debbie looks like she she's receiving redemption for herself at the same time playing the savior for her daughter. But in reality, 
carried was her own savior and garnered the redemption for the pain she had suffered. A, a total narcissist, very, very abusive. And unfortunately, as usual, the narcissist supplier, Carrie, myself, and other people out there had to carry the burden of guilt because narcissists can't be accountable for anything. They won't take accountability for anything. At the same time, she wanted to play savior, but she couldn't. The last part here, yeah. the next one, number three, Karen feels afraid because she can't control the shoes, just like she can't control her own obsession. Karen learns, Karen learns that the old lady has died. She goes to the executioner's house and begs to begs him to cut off her feet so she will be freed from the curse of the red shoes. I digress. She goes to a professional who cures people. Now, I want to share this uh, situation with you. I, I find it remarkable. Talk about forgiveness. An old black woman, this is true, and it's mentioned a lot of times in the circles of the Christian and evangelical in, during sermons. During the time, an old black woman who lost her son and husband to the hands of the Ku Klux Klan, Klan asked the convicted leader if she could love him. During the time of the heydays of the Ku Klux Klan, black people were in fear of their daily lives. A black family of three with a typical mother, father and son living in the south of the USA. Their lives were devastated when the leader of the Ku Klux Klan captured the father, tied him up and poured gasoline in over him and burnt him to death. And just before they lit the match, in front of his family, he begged for forgiveness. He said, forgive them for they, know, for they know not what they do. And as the smell of burning flesh engulfed the air, those were his last words. Time later, <clears throat> the clan came back again and took the son and did exactly the same thing. He begged in the same way and asked his mother, forgive them, for they know, 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 know what they do. And as the smell of burning flesh engulfed the air for the second time, God only knows what immense pain this woman must have experienced. Time passed, and the court case was held. The judge sentenced the Ku Klux Klan leader to life. But just then, the old black woman interrupted the judge and asked if she could be brought to the leader and much to the judge's surprise she asked the man if he could visit her <clears throat> a couple times a week because she still has a love in her heart and she would like to give her love to him could anyone listening imagine this scenario could you do this I don't think I could. Imagine that. I still have love in my heart. After this man single-handedly destroyed her family, he re received redemption and he was wiped of guilt, which I personally don't think he deserved. But this woman was amazing. Now let's move on to the trigger points. There were several things that triggered me. Karma, the guilt for not taking care of my mother. Well, I, I just briefly mentioned this. Um, I, I think uh, people that have graciously listened and come to my podcast, and I thank you very much. I appreciate you listening. I appreciate you give me some thumbs up even though I would like a couple more thumbs up and comments and subscribers 
but uh, thank you so much. So karma for not taking care of my mother. Well, I had this situation. I think I've explained it. I used to go to a full-time dance college during the week. And at the weekends, I would go to the weekends art college where I ended up getting um, a scholarship to go and dance in New York for six uh, six weeks, actually. And one one day, one Sunday, my mother woke up in her very manipulative self and also being just really scared, said, Melody, I had a dream. I had a terrible dream that something terrible was going to happen to you. And I don't want you to leave today. You can't leave. But what she was really saying, I don't want to be alone. I don't want to be alone with myself and with my own thoughts and with my own emptiness. So I want you to stay the narcissist supplier and fill me up. And I said to her, basically, well, I'm still going to go. I, I said to her, I hope you feel better, but I'm still going to go. Anyway, cut a long story short. I went, did my classes. I had a wonderful day, came back. She was very quiet and sullen, you know, moody, wanted to control the narrative and the atmosphere. And then the next day, I don't know, I must have subconsciously felt guilty. I ended up getting into an accident and bruising the coxit, my coxit tail and being out of action for dancing for about one to two, one and a half weeks. And my mother said to me when I came home that night and handed me a glass of scotch while I was soaking my back in the bath, this is what you get for not taking care of me. The burden of guilt is on you. You're my mother. I'm not your mother. She didn't say that, but that's basically what she was saying. You're here to take care of me. You're the slave. And I let you out of jail when I tell you to, you're out of jail, not when anybody else is. So that's one of the triggers that got to me because it's, it reminds me so much of what happened in the story. She she couldn't stay with her sick mother. She was just so fascinated and so obsessed with these shoes. And the shoes basically took over her, her life and her mind and her being. She wanted to be where she was happy. And coming from poverty, she, did, she didn't have much many opportunities to experience being happy. There was another one that um, I saw from the TED talk about uh, um, a mother who came from Ethiopia. She was pregnant. She was going on to do a postgraduate at Oxford University. She had the child and she wanted to put the child in foster care just for a little while just for a couple of days a week so she could do her work and then she would look after the child during the rest of the week. Well, the social services weren't going to agree to that. So they took the child from her and put it in a permanent home, foster home. Now in this foster home, the, the family, they were Catholic, strict, strict Catholics. And the woman decided to adopt a child even if it was a white, black child, because she couldn't have children. So she thought. And so every day he'd have to bend on his knees for forgiveness, kneel on his, stand on his knees for forgiveness and pray. Like they already, I think they had one child. And then while he was there, she had another child, she got pregnant. And then after that, she got another child. And then what she did was she started to call him the devil. She started to say that, you know, there are things about you that's evil. You're the devil. You really, really are like the devil. So eventually, he called social services and said that there was something wrong with him. He was like the devil. And he spent the rest of his life in, until he was about 18, 19 years old, in like these these places, like big homes, like a, almost like a, a shelter, but for 
foster foster children. And it was really, really awful. And he talks about all the super super characters that you see in the cartoons. That ba uh, Batman, he's he was an orphan. Um, Cinderella, she was in foster care. And he really re threads the story this way. It's so incredible. And how, again, the church is brought, religion is brought back into this story. The burden of guilt, redemption, playing the savior, all of this stuff, on and on and on and on and on. She could have just said, look, I know I said that I would look after you for until a certain age, but I'm in this situation where I have three or four other children, my own children, and I don't want to do this, but I'm going to have to send you back to the authorities. That would have been better instead of calling him the devil. And that really, really triggered me because I think a lot of times that the church, the church, not the, the spiritual part, but the church, the actual organization, places the burden of guilt and places sin in places where they have no business doing, doing so. And this really triggered me. But because I've done my own healing and I, I have God in my life on a spiritual level and I have a lot of strength there in my own faith, I've done my healing. Yes, I do get triggered. I understand why I get triggered and then I recover. The next one, is uh, quite personal and it's about a family member whose mother was a narcissist and um, she wanted to get married to her boyfriend and the boyfriend was in the military and he said not now I, I don't want to get married so she said I'm pregnant and he said I still don't want to get married because I'm in the military right now and I'm still, I'm active. So she had this child called Eric, I will call him. She had this child and for the rest of his life, she made him suffer. She made him really, really suffer. Like you're the reason why I didn't, never got married. You're the reason why your dad didn't stay around. She blackmailed him. She manipulated him. It was just so awful to him. And she finally pulled out the silver bullet that really took him over the edge. And then she said to him, when he was about 40 years old, she said, and your father raped me. Now the father, uh, her father didn't rape his father didn't rape her, but she needed to she needed to really hurt him. She wanted to really hurt him, and she did, because after that he went he went literally crazy. He went over the edge, and he started he became a criminal. He he started, you know, robbing places, not big places, but. He, he was thrown in prison a couple of times. So he was in prison for about four or five years. Then when he got home, when he got out of prison, you know, he couldn't really hold down a job. He was just so confused and so hurt that his mother would do such a thing and say such a thing. Talk about control and keeping him a prisoner for the rest of his life. <laughs> so one day he he was cooking something and his mother gets a phone call and says uh, your son's heart stopped beating he's dead he'd been dead for 24 almost 48 hours before people found found him and then in the hypocritical mother turns around and she says my only child my only child has died I can't believe it it's not possible 
taking no account for her hideous behaviour and what she said, which was a total lie. No wonder, as a woman who has experienced that type of thing, violence, it's hard for women to come forward and say these things because you get other women out there using it and lying and pretending that they were raped when they were not. And it's awful. Why would anybody do that and say that about their own son, that he was born out of rape, meaning that she never loved him. And of course, if you're born out of rape, nobody loved you. That really triggered me because I just found out that this guy died about a year and a half ago. I didn't realize it. And it really, really hurt. But I also understood that same guilt, burden of truth, manipulation, emotional blackmail that narcissists do. The last one is about me stepping out of the emotional prison. I digress. She, she pays the final sacrifice for happiness. And being that special girl, at least for a while, then she soars with the angels. Karen was her own savior. And Karen, it was free from any guilt when she died, when her heart burst open and she dies. Well, I stepped out of emotional prison in 1982, October of 1982, when I decided to leave England and go to dance in New York for, th for what I thought was going to be a year, but turned out for 13 years. And as the wolves escaped the runway, I knew it was the beginning of my adventure with freedom. Taking my life back, I no longer have to be a slave trapped with no future. You see, my mother wanted me. She didn't want me to have my own life. She wanted me to have her life. She wanted she wanted to be a dancer. She wanted to be a nurse. She wanted to be a teacher. She wanted to be all those things. And she wanted, she wanted to live through me. And I had to be her. And for a really long time, well, 20 until I was 21, she she controlled, she controlled the situation, she controlled the narrative. And I was in an emotional prison for a really long time. And even when I stepped out of that emotional prison, because I did not understand my what I'd experienced in my childhood, this stayed with me all the way that I was in my 50s, almost late 50s, until I eventually was able to unlock that prison door, that emotional prison door inside of me and step into the light and step into freedom. So that sentence really, it, it, it triggered me. She pays a final sacrifice for happiness. Yes, I paid finally my final sacrifice for happiness. In 82, that was the beginning. And then in my late 50s, I was able to say, Goodbye to the guilt, goodbye to the pain, to most of it, not all of it. It's still there, but I understand what it is. I know that I'm being triggered, and I say adios to being triggered. Anyway, that was today's episode of The Curse of Poverty, or what you'd like to call The Red Shoes. I would just like to say thank you for listening. Thank you for people coming, for coming. Thank you for the likes when you do give a like. Thank you for the comments when you leave a comment. And thank you for the subscribers. 
I just would like to ask if you could do it on a more frequent basis. I really appreciate it. I'd like to receive some of your love. That would be great. And I want to close out and say, healing is a lifelong lesson and blessing and gift we give ourselves, mind, body, and soul. Healing is a lifelong lesson blessing and gift we give ourselves mind body and soul take care until next week goodbye <laughs>